I'm settling back into rhythms here, um, but early this morning and as I was writing my sermon, I couldn't help but think about where I was exactly a week ago, sitting on the beach. It was pretty good. <laughs> Enjoying that sun and that smell of salt and sand, um, a bunch of us began to notice that there were sailboats going out for these half-hour excursions and coming back, and us thinking that they were going to be really expensive, we thought, oh, we won't go, and then we checked, and it was just a little bit of a tip to the guide. So five of us loaded on to the sailboat and headed out. And the boat was very low to the water, and so our bodies were as well, and as we pushed off the shore, the shoreline grew smaller, the reggae beach music grew quiet. And after a while, when we had stopped making castaway jokes, Wilson, <laughs> we eventually grew quiet too, quiet and small, like the seashore. In our text today, we meet Jesus standing on a shoreline. And I think he was also feeling this need to push off from the shore. His reputation was beginning to precede him everywhere he went. Huge crowds would gather, hoping to see him and hear him and even brush past him. And I think he could feel the intensity of this crowd, this deep desire of every person gathered there, needing to hear just the right word that they needed in that moment. And I'm sure I can just imagine like the crowd pressing in and that feeling of claustrophobia. And as he's pushed further and further out, getting closer to the shoreline, he sees two empty boats off to the side. And he sees the men standing there cleaning their nets. This, the last chore of their night. And I imagine he noted the lack of fish. Their nets were empty. There wasn't much to clean, really. But he approaches this one man, Simon, convincing him to push off from the shore so he can have this safe space away from the closeness of the crowd. Now these men, these simple fishermen who just a few verses later in the scripture suddenly become his disciples, this was their very final chore after a very long night. They were third shift workers. If any of you have ever worked in the late night hours, they worked at night in the dark and then would sleep during the day. They were comfortable working in these long, hard nights and apparently working long and hard and not receiving anything from the nets at times. So not so different from you or I. They were probably ready for a meal. They needed a nap. You know the feeling on Friday afternoon, trying to get out of the office or wherever it is you work, and you're just trying to make it to the car before somebody asks you to do one last thing before you leave. Probably recognizing that this guy was an important guy, maybe even having heard of him, Simon agrees, figuring, hey, I'll give the guy a break, and I can't get this work done anyway with all these people stomping on my nets, so I'll just, I'll just do this for him. But then Jesus pushes his limits once he's out there. He tells him, cast your net out. Now, if you're like me, I don't really care too much for when people, random people off the street try to tell me how to do my job. I get a little tired and cranky, or if I am already tired and cranky, I'm not real polite about it necessarily when people try to boss me around like that. The thing is, whenever we read dialogue in scripture, I think we can give the disciples and any other character way too much credit. When we read, we imagine these people to be, have perfect character, never get upset, they're very pure. But I think if we really are reading and paying attention and are using our imaginations as we read, I think we'll see something very different. So whenever I read the scripture, I always picture Simon giving Jesus that wary eyebrow that sometimes I give people. <laughs> and only just barely, only just barely hiding that doubt and that sarcasm in his tone of voice. Tia, okay, I'm kind of worn out here, dude. But just to prove you wrong, I'll throw that net in just for you. And of course, in the end, the joke 
is on him. We really are very like these men, these disciples at times. We can be cynical from having one too many bad fishing days, doubting, worn out by our routine, working too many hours, and not necessarily by choice, or simply assuming we already know what the day is going to bring because we've lived so many days already, we know better. But I don't think we do. And if we do think that, we clearly need some serious shaking up, which is what Jesus does for these disciples. I wonder, what would it look like for us to cast our nets in this Lenten season? What would it look like to make some room in our lives for something unexpected? For that dazzling possibility that maybe, just maybe, God made us for more than routine. What would it look like to cast those nets out and wait and just see what God gives us? Our ability to evolve, to be brave, and throw those nets out, I believe it all begins with our ability to pray. And that's very fitting because guess what? If you didn't know it, if you have kids or grandkids in Sunday school today, they are talking about what it means to be open in prayer. So just to make sure you all have something to talk about in the car, here are a few snippets of what they are learning today. They are learning that God permeates every single part of our existence. And that prayer is how we intimately connect to that presence. And that it's not about expressing words necessarily to a God who is somewhere else. Prayer is how we accept our responsibility in making the presence of God visible. And prayer serves two different objectives. It is meant to encourage us and it's meant to challenge us. In the book, Eat, Pray, Love, which was a best-selling memoir, believe it or not, 10 years ago, I looked at the copyright in my book and I couldn't believe it was 10 years ago that that book came out. But Elizabeth Gilbert, the author, she spent a year traveling to India and Italy and Indonesia seeking to find a renewed sense of balance in her life and hoping to connect with the divine. And on her stay in India, she stayed at an ashram. And in one part of her book, she reflects on what she observed as bravery. And all the devotees who had traveled there from all over the world, people who had traveled to just sit in prayer and meditation, and who were willing to go deep into their minds, not having a clue what they were going to find there. And as she watches over these travelers, she, one day she receives a letter from her friend Mike, who's back in the U.S., and he is a wildlife filmmaker for National Geographic. And he wrote in his letter about this gathering that he had went to recently. It was a gathering of all of these explorers, and they were being initiated into something called the Explorers Club. And he said it was amazing to just be in the presence of all of these incredibly courageous people, all of whom had risked their lives multiple times throughout their whole life to go and explore the most remote and dangerous places, mountain ranges and ocean depths and ice fields. And he talked about how many of them were actually missing fingers and toes and their nose because they had interacted with one too many sharks over the years or had suffered frostbite. And he wrote, you have never seen so many brave people gathered in one place in your life. And she in India, looking around at all the people, meditating in front of her, thought to herself, you ain't seen nothing. A lot of us have been tricked into some misconceptions about what prayer is. Prayer done well, is one of the bravest and least boring things you can do. Prayer is about casting that net, being vulnerable, and willing to believe that God is going to give you something to pull in, something that will feed you and transform you. So if we're going to cast this net in Lent, what does that look like? 
Maybe it's making ourselves more flexible. Being willing to look at the world, our own faith, other people with more open eyes, letting go of prejudices maybe we've held for a long time. Maybe it's putting in the time to heal a relationship. Or maybe you need new friendship in your life. Or you need to let go of that one friendship that just isn't serving you or the other person anymore. Or you need to say yes to something, even when it terrifies you. Because usually when something terrifies us, it's often the thing that we need most in our life. Or saying no to what harms us, to what numbs us, to the things we use to self-medicate, like that Facebook or our Netflix at home. Or maybe it's just choosing to listen more than speaking. Or if being quiet is usually your normal way of being in the world, maybe it's time to challenge yourself and offer the rest of us your wisdom. This sermon series that we are going to be beginning in Lent, and the book that we will all be studying, hopefully together, is entitled Wondrous Encounters. The question today is, are we willing, over these next 40 plus days, to put ourselves in the spiritual space to even have a wondrous encounter. In this Lenten season, we are called back to ourselves to remember whose we are, and especially on Ash Wednesday, to remember that we aren't necessarily long for this world. And if we only have this little bit of time, we need to get going on living what Mary Oliver refers to as this one wild, precious life. God invites us to push offshore and sail and explore other seas, not only in the physical world, but in your own soul. So how will we be awestruck these next 40 days? What crazy, wonderful things will we pull up in our nets? How will it cause us to drop our old life and forge ahead? Amen.